Okay, so that being said, um, a very simple message tonight. I was walking around the track, I heard this phrase, came back, wrote it out the next day. It's called, You Must Believe to Receive. Nothing new, nothing uh, uh, you haven't heard before, but sometimes you've got to hear again and again before you get it, right? So we're going to use Romans 1, 16 through 17. It says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith, for faith. Another translation says, by faith, into faith, out of faith, into faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. The bottom line is, um, God's revelation is made known to us and we participate in it, we receive it by faith. So we come into this walk with the Lord through faith, but it's called a walk of faith and it's our faith that must endure to see the promises of God all the way to the time that we go to be with the Lord. It's our faith that we walk out. Paul says, I fought the good fight of faith, right? And so faith is really, really important. Really, that's what this message is about. And again, you must believe to receive. Almost everything that God has provided for us or his people to experience is grasped and manifested through faith. As I've said before, I uh, read this from Miles Monroe. It just really stuck with me. Faith is the currency of the kingdom. Faith is the open door through which the resources, provision, and the power of God as contained within his word, within his promises, are released. Faith, faith is not, I've been watching uh, Star Wars, anybody like Star Wars, you know, and, and I enjoy those movies, but you know, there's a, there's a part of it, sometimes people think uh, the uh, faith is like the force. If you can just tap into the force, you can do a lot of things. If you can just tap into faith, you can do a lot of things. Well, faith is powerful, but it's not like the force, right? Faith is not a mystical source like the force in Star Wars that one taps into to access power. Faith is the attitude of trust and belief in the character and the faithfulness of God to himself and to his word. In other words, faith trusts God. It's God that does the work. Am I making sense to you? It's not your faith that does the work. It's your faith that trusts God to do the work. Amen? So, in Psalms 18 and 30, it says, This God, His way, is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in Him. Romans 3 and 4, By no means let God be true, though everyone is a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. And I read those just so you'll realize that God is faithful to Himself and God is faithful to His word. What I want to emphasize today is that in order to receive from God, you've got to believe God. We must believe Him. We must believe His Word in order to receive. Even though all the promises of God are yes, <coughs> excuse me, we will not experience all that God has made available to us without believing, ultimately without having faith. To make this point, I want to highlight three areas as we move through the message tonight. One is that God's Word is true. Two, God's word is powerful, or you could say God's word is power. And number three, God's power is released in our lives through faith. So very simple progression. We're going to start with the first one. God's word is true. And then under that, that topic or that heading there, we're just going to look at what the Bible says, what God says about his word. Now, not, not a lot to this point, but I believe that scripture can uh, testify to itself. God sh tells you what he feels or what his word is, of, is, is, is to us, and he shares it and relates it to us through the word of God that we have. Psalms 119 and 89, David says, Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. In other words, it's not going to change as far as you're concerned. Right? 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. 2 Corinthians 1 and 20, For all the promises of God find their yes in Him. That is why it is through Him that we utter our amen for His glory, to God for His glory. Psalms 119 and 160, The sum of your word is truth. 
and every one of your righteous rules endures forever. John 17 and 17 says, Sanctify them, your, your people, in the truth. Your word is true. So we need to get to a place where we come to an understanding that God is right, God's word is true, and it's that belief in what God says about his word that allows us to stand upon his word and see the power of his word released in our life. Now, at first, we saw already what God says about it. Now it's important that we understand what do God's people say. And this is important. What we're really talking about is we have God's testimony and then we have our testimony. Okay? God's word is truth. It's based on his faithfulness. God's power is released through faith in the, in the word of a faithful God. We whom have experienced, and I'm talking about the people of God, God's salvation power in our lives, can all attest to or testify to the fact that God's word is true. We testify to the validity of what I'm stating because we've all experienced the fruit of what I'm saying. God's word is true. And you say, how do we all experience that fruit? Every one of us in this place was saved because of the word of God that was spoken to us and because of God's word and the promise of God's word that if we'll call upon the name of the Lord, we shall be saved. We put our faith in what God said and we put our faith when we put our faith in what God said, it released God's saving power into our life and everyone here that has had an experience with God can stand up and say I'm not the same person that I was God came into my life and I changed why did that happen because God's word is true and we're a testimony to the truth of God's word am I making sense to you Ephesians 2 8 and 9 for by grace you have been saved how through faith and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. God's grace, and I like the, the definition of grace, is the empowering presence of God. Grace is more than just receiving something we didn't deserve. Grace is actually the empowering presence of God. I, I don't have time to really go into depth on how that's the case, but I do want you to know that Jesus had great grace upon him, and so Jesus had more than just the divine favor of God. The grace of God was the power of God that rested on his life. When God gave gifts to the church, he gave the fivefold gifts. They're called grace gifts. Those grace gifts are empowerment gifts that are given to the church to equip us in the things of God. The Spirit of God is called the Spirit of Grace. The gifts that the Holy Spirit imparts unto us are more than just uh, receiving something that we didn't deserve. They're actually the empowerment of God to do things we could not do without the grace of God or the empowerment of God flowing through our life. We had two prophetic words given here tonight. They didn't just think about this and write out something that was really nice. The presence of the Lord came upon them. And when they yielded to the Spirit of God, the grace of God or the empowerment of God enabled them to do something they could not do just a moment before. Am I making sense to you? So God's grace is the empowering presence of God and it was released into our lives as we put our faith in Him and the word of God that was presented to us. As a result, we experience salvation as his grace or empowerment was released into our lives and God's power did its work in us. The testimony of those who have experienced the truth of what God says, particularly as, as I'm talking about and pertaining to salvation, witnesses to God's faithfulness and is the basis for trust that not only is this promise true, but all God's word is true. Well, make sense to you. You say, well, how do I know? You ever had that thought? How do I know that this word is true? Well, when you heard the word of God about salvation, if it wasn't true, you, there's a possibility you wouldn't have been saved or somebody else may not be saved. But we know and we understand because we live in a, uh, 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 the, the Bible talks about a cloud of witnesses in heaven, but we are a cloud of witnesses here on earth. And every one of us can testify that when we called upon the name of the Lord, God didn't say, well, let me think about it. God didn't say, um, I don't know, let me weigh this out and see if I want to do this or not, or let me see what kind of mood I'm in. He didn't do that because all his promises are yes, and if we believe him, we will see the fulfillment of his promise because God's word is true. So we experience that when it came to salvation, and if we experience it when it comes to salvation, then we give testimony to the fact that God is true, and if he's true in one area, he is true in all areas because his word says so. 
So we give testimony to that. I'm personally testifying to you today that as I put my faith in God's Word, it proved itself true in my life. When I, whenever I, I was in my room and I'd heard, call upon the name of the Lord, you shall be saved, I said, God, are you real? I didn't do it exactly right. I didn't say the right words, but my heart was saying, I sure hope you are because I really need you. And when I called on Him, guess what? He met me there in my room, and I felt the presence of God. I had an experience with God, and I knew from that moment that who I was is no longer who I am. I can testify to that. And I've been serving God since 1985, so that's at least three or four years. I can't do math on the run. But I've been serving God, and then a month later, somebody told me about the promise of the baptism of the Holy Spirit in my life. I said, God, your word is true. I want that in my life. I called upon the name of the Lord, and when I called upon the name of the Lord because of the promise of God that was made known to me and revealed to me, when I called, put my faith in that, God baptized me in the Holy Spirit just like his word says. Amen? So we're, I'm here to tell you that because of what I've experienced in life, I can testify to you that God's word is true. So to put it bluntly, God testifies that his word is true, and we, his people, testify that his word is true because we've had an experience with God. And let me just put this in there. That is why it is imperative that we as a people testify to who God is. I heard somebody say it the other way. Our children don't need to just learn Bible stories. They need to hear your story. Because you give validity to what they're learning. You give uh, flesh to what they're reading. You are a testimony to the power of God that God revealed through His Word, but also revealed through you. It is imperative that as a people of God, we break through that barrier of, of fear and that barrier of political correctness, and we begin to tell people, even if it's the people, it begins with the people in church, but also the people outside, we need to tell them our story. I am not today who I was because I had an encounter with an almighty God. Am I making sense to you? They have to know. To put it bluntly, our testimony of our experience with God gives word, God's word validity. and it, I mean, it gives validity to the truthfulness of what God's word says it is, which is true. We prove God's word to be true. And let me also state that our experience doesn't make God's word true. Our experience reveals the undeniable truth of God's word. God's word is true regardless of our experience, but our experience reveals the truthfulness of God's word. Am I making sense to you? Okay, so the next thing we want to look at is not only is, is God's word true, but God's word is powerful. In fact, the scripture actually says that we read in our text at the beginning, it says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation. So you could actually say God's word is not just powerful, God's word is power. So I thought about this for a minute, and you're going to have to excuse the way I label this because I think some people aren't going to grasp exactly what I meant by this, but I want to look at two kinds of power. First of all, uh, I, and I use the word natural, there, there might have been another way of saying this, but I want to explain to you what I meant by natural power. Uh, God's word is powerful in the natural sense. When I use the phrase natural power, I'm trying to find a way to speak to the power of God's word to change our life through the direction that it gives to us in life on a natural plane. For instance, it says in Joshua 1 and 8, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. You shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. So in other words, it gives direction to what we need to do in life. Proverbs 3, 5, and 8. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. In other words, uh, is this the right thing to do or not? The Word of God says it's not a good thing to do. Is this the right thing to do right here? The Word of God says it is the right thing to do. It gives us direction in life, not necessarily power, supernatural power being released into our life, but it is revealing to us the ways of God, the wisdom of God, so that we can make good decisions in life. Am I making sense to you what I meant by natural power? Okay? So as I hear and implement these principles, I find God's wisdom impacting my life. Let me give you a few more examples. 
Proverbs 17, 28. Even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he's deemed intelligent. I grabbed onto that one real quick. Uh, <laughs> there was another one that says, When words are many, sin is not absent, but he who holds his tongue is wise. And I said, Well, God, I may not be, uh, be able to utter a lot of wisdom, but if I keep my mouth shut, I can sure look like I'm wise. So no, nothing supernatural being released there, but it is supernatural wisdom that can guide us in life so that we can have favor and success in life. Am I making sense to you? Proverbs 13, 24, Whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves, loves him is diligent to discipline him. To discipline mean, means more than just to tell him what's right, but to lead him in the right direction, to train him. Amen? And it could be him, it could be her, whatever the case may be. That's good instruction that's good wisdom which actually the world is totally reverting that and turning that on its head and they're trying to tell you that that's not ever since the 60s or the 70s they're trying to tell you that's not what you should do but because of that we have now the people that are living and running our country now because they never got any discipline in life just give them whatever they want. Let them cry. Give them whatever they want. You know, just appease them. And the next thing you know, you got kids that are trying to run the home, and then you have immature people trying to run the government. <laughs> Probably fact checker's going to check this. You saw my fact checkers, right? Mo, Larry, and Curly. Anyway, anyway. Proverbs 15 and 27, it says, Whoever is greedy for unjust gain troubles his own household, but he who hates bribes will live. That's good wisdom. Proverbs 21, wine is a mocker, strong drink, a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Now, I'm going to pause here. I wasn't going to do this, but I'm going to pause here since I went ahead and mentioned that. The big thing going around Christian circles today is, can I drink if I'm a Christian? Well, you can do whatever you want, right? Now, here's the thing. Well, the Bible doesn't say we can drink, we can't drink, but the Bible actually does talk about Wine being a mocker, strong drink a brawler, and whoever is led astray by them is not wise. So what is the wisest man in the world teaching you? Probably not a good thing to do. Here's another thing in Proverbs uh, chapter 29, or actually chapter 31, when he says right here, he says, uh, it's not for kings, O Lemuel, that's a pet name for Solomon, it's not for kings to drink wine or for rulers to de desire strong drink, for they will drink and forget what is decreed and pervert the rights of the afflicted. Give strong drink to him who is perishing and wine to him whose life is bitter. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his trouble no more. I want you to know that God calls you a royal priesthood and a holy nation. A lot of times we're asking the wrong questions because we don't know who we are. We're saying, can I drink? Because we have a poverty mindset and we have the mindset of a servant and a slave and all we want to do is, is take care of ourselves and take care of our own needs. But when you recognize that you are more than that, you are the child of the king and God set you on this earth to not just take care of yourself but to lead other people and to ensure them, then all of a sudden this verse applies to you. And what does the Spirit of God say? Drinking is not for kings. Am I making sense to you? Paul said it this way, uh, uh, he said, all things are lawful for me, I can do whatever I want, but then he goes on and say, all things are not beneficial for you. So if I want to live on the first side, which is really immaturity express, I can do whatever I want, and that's what people are saying, can I drink, I can do whatever I want. The Bible says, well that's just an immature kid saying, I can do whatever I want, I can have chocolate, I'll just eat chocolate, I'll eat donuts, you know, but thank God there's a mom and dad telling you, man, that's not really what you want to do. Now, if you grow up in life and you're 21, 22 years old and you're left house and you just want to eat chocolate and donuts all your life, you're going to find out pretty quick. You can do it. You're free to do it, but it ain't going to be good for you. When you become an adult, you begin to realize, I've got to start eating these little things called vegetables that I didn't like when I was a kid if I want to have long life. And if I want to feed my kids and I want my kids to grow up and I start having children and I want them to grow up healthy and whole, I can't just go to McDonald's three times a day. I can't go to McDonald's one times a day. I've got to start learning to eat broccoli. I've got to start learning how to eat stuff that I never wanted because now I'm not just living for me. I'm living for them. I'm making sense here. And that's the same thing we get. I don't know. I got off on that. I need to get back. Anyway. 
What I'm wanting you to see is the Word of God reveals to us good, solid principles in life that will steer us into living healthy and godly lifestyles if we put them into practice. But the Word of God is also powerful, as powerful as it is on a natural guidance level, it's also powerful on a supernatural level. And I want to look at the supernatural power of God. In Hebrews 1 and 3, it says, He, Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature, and He upholds the universe by the word of His power. People are trying to find uh, dark matter, and they're trying to find these forces that keeps everything together. The Bible tells us what it is. It is Jesus, it is the word of God, upholding the entire universe by the word of His power. It doesn't say He upheld it. It doesn't say he will uphold it. He says it up, he upholds it by the word of his power. In Hebrews 4 and 12, it says the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Luke 1, 37, it says nothing will be impossible with God. You might say, where'd that come from? That doesn't mean anything. Why would you put that in there? Because you need to know the Greek. You need to know what it says in the original language, a literal translation of the Greek says not without power from God every rhema or every word what does that mean every word of God contains the power of God within it are you hearing what I'm saying God's word is not just powerful God's word is power there is power contained in the word of God like a D like a little TNT stick of dynamite we understand that doesn't look like there's much to it you can throw it around play with it but you Treat that thing right and with respect if you know what it is because if you know how to harness that TNT, it'll blow a hole in anything, right? Well, I want you to know that the Word of God, it just looks like good wisdom, and it is, and it just looks like natural truth, and it is, but it's more than that. If you grab a hold and you know how the Word of God functions and you understand some principles in the Word of God, if you, if you light that thing right and correctly, if you release the power of God in the appropriate way, it'll blow a hole in any mountain or circumstance that stands in your way. Am I making sense to you? In other words, I would state it this way, that in order to bring about the full meaning of the text, the Word of God contains within it the power to bring itself to pass. That power is in the Word, but it must be released. I want to use a a, a lady by the name of Sarah in the Old Testament. She was the wife of Abraham. For a good example, just a visible illustration of what I'm talking about. In Genesis 18, 9 through 12, it says, They said to him, uh, the, the people that were uh, with Abraham, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, she's in the tent. And the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Sarah was listening, just like any good wife would do, listening in on the conversation, at the tent door behind him. And Abraham and Sarah were old and advanced in years, and the way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I'm worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? Well, guess what? Not an ounce of faith there. But God said that this time next year you're going to have a son. The word of God that God released into their lives contained power. Now, I'm telling you that that power is released through faith. Well, when did that happen? When did that take place? Because it doesn't look like Sarah had a lot of faith at that particular time. Well, thank the Lord, we have Hebrews 11 and 11. And Hebrews 11 and 11 says, By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. So somewhere between the time that he released the word of God into her life and she laughed, somewhere down the road she started thinking about it, she started meditating on it, she started uh, thinking about the word of God, mulling it over in her life, uh, chewing on that word, and somewhere faith was birthed in her, and when faith was birthed in her life, that word of God that contained power had now the freedom freedom to move and to actually give her a supernatural rejuvenation of her womb and because of that she was able to conceive seed and she brought forth the promise of God in her life. I'm going to make sense to you. So uh, uh, somewhere along the journey she began to believe what she had before laughed at and as a result the power to conceive was imparted into her life and she brought forth the promise of God through her life and that brings me to my my last point, and my last point is God's power is released through faith. I told you, not a difficult message, 
not something you hadn't heard before, but we need to go over this and we need to remember and we need to reinforce how we walk out the promises of God in our life, right? How many of y'all, uh, if you uh, would like to know, if you had money in the bank, you would like to know every single way that you can access it, right? My, my dad... He gets a, a little bit of money every month. We call that a Social Security paycheck. And my dad, uh, he needs to be able to pay some things because he wanted a car and he wanted to do these things. So uh, I help my dad. Uh, but, uh, you know, I need to figure out how can I have access to that money? Because if I have to rely on my dad, uh, it's not that my dad uh, doesn't have the money. It's just sometimes he forgets that he needs to pay a bill, he, you know, whatever the case may be. And so uh, I said, I need to figure out how to access that account. Well, I didn't have an ATM card, so I couldn't access it that way uh, you know I didn't have access to account <clears throat> with online banking so I couldn't access it that way so I had to figure out how to do this but once I got access to his account then I could uh, uh, partake, partake of what was available in order to be able to help my dad so what I'm trying to get you to understand is just because you have stuff available to you if you don't know how to access it you're not going to be able to walk in the fullness of what you possess and God tells us that we have access to all the promises of God that God has made available to us, but they're not in the earthly realm, they're in the heavenly realm, and we need to figure out how is it that we're going to access the promises of God. Well, the first thing that we need to understand is that we can't access what we don't know. Right? So the, the, remember the text says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. How can you believe in something, and we'll get here in a minute, where you don't know? I'm about to read that text to you. So the first thing that's important is you've got to have God's word revealed to you. The Bible says, My people perish for lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge of what? Lack of knowledge of God's word. They're just living out life and the way they've been taught how to live out life, the way they've always lived out life. I can't tell you how many Christians get saved and they don't transform their thinking. They live life the same way as they always live. They got an experience with God. They got a certificate that said to themselves, not literally a certificate, but they may have got one that said, you said the sinner's prayer, you're going to heaven, but they live the same way they've always lived. They're expecting supernatural results, but they're ignorant of the ways of God. Right? So the first thing you need to understand is you need to understand what does God's word say and how is it going to happen if God's word is not revealed. Romans 10, 13 through 17, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone telling them or preaching to them? And how are they to preach unless they are sent as, as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. So there the imperative is, is that you've got to know what God's word says. You can find out what God's word says whenever you read the word of God on your own, but you can also, as in our text, come to know what the word of God says by people telling you and sharing with you, this is what the word of God teaches. Am I making sense to you? There again, the imperative of testifying and telling people about Jesus, about telling people, informing them about what the word of God says to, to, to them, and the imperative and the necessity and why you guys have allowed me to be in this position where I can teach you the Word of God because if you don't know what the Word of God says, how are you going to press into what the Word of God says, right? I think in, in Matthew 10, I was trying to find this, it, uh, Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority and he said to go and preach the gospel and, and, and he said, as you enter the house, give it your greeting. If the house is worthy, give it your blessing. But if it's not worthy, take back your blessing. Whoever does not receive you nor heed your words as you go out of that city, shake the dust off your feet. Now, the point here is not so much that they, they, they didn't, that you got to shake the dust off your feet. The point I'm trying to tell you is that even if you make the word of God known to people, that doesn't necessarily believe that, uh, say that they're going to receive it. Right? I, I can't tell you how many people say, I don't believe that. I don't agree with that. I, 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 I'm not going to do that. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to see that. Don't tell me that. Right? Like the monkeys. Doom, doom, doom. Well, you know what? 
you, first thing is you got to hear, you got to know what the Word of God says, but if you, you know what the Word of God says and you don't believe what the Word of God says, it's not going to do you any good. you got to believe it. Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. In other words, faith is this. Uh, another translation says it is the uh, 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 title deed of things hoped for and the convincing evidence of things not seen. So if you have a title deed to a piece of property, some of you already know this, even if you've never seen the property, you've never stepped on the property, if you have a title deed to that piece of property, you have an assurity of knowing that property is yours. Well, make sense? You didn't see it with your eyes. All you have is a deed, but your deed, that's what the faith is. Faith is the title deed to things hoped for. It's like saying, I know that thing is mine. And it's the convincing evidence of things not seen. Did you know that you ever sit on a jury and you got a case brought before you as a jury? You've never seen what happened. You weren't there. But what happens is the people come and they pre present convincing evidence. And when they present this convincing evidence, they're able to say in, with some certainty, they have to get to a place where they say with some certainty, no, that ain't what happened or that is what happened. Right Now, whenever we have the Word of God and we read the Word of God, faith says that's the way it is. That's what God says. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Mark 9, 23 through 23 says, If you can do anything, the, a man comes to Jesus and said, If you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, If you can, all things are possible if you believe. Now listen to that. The Word of God Himself, testified by the Word of God, says anything is possible if you believe God. Right? Now remember, faith is not a force. So in other words, it's not just, hey, I believe, and this is what I want. I believe, and this is what's going to happen in life. No, that's just a force. No, faith is in God and the faithfulness of God to His Word. So you can have faith for anything, but it's going to be faith in God and what God has said. Make a sense to you. That's what the Word of God teaches us. And so your, your faith is not just in faith. Your faith is in God. So you, 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 if you can do anything, Jesus says, all things are possible to one who believes. I want to give you a biblical example of faith. In 2 Kings 4, 1 through 7, uh, there was a wife of one of the prophets who cried to Elisha, your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord, but the creditor has come to take my children to be his slaves. And Elisha said to her, what do you want me to do for you? I like the translation, says, woman, what do you want from me? And tell me, what have you in the house? And she said, your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. And he said, go outside, borrow vessels from all your neighbors, empty vessels and not too few. Then go in and shut the door behind yourself and your sons and pour into all these vessels. And when one is full, set it aside. So she went from him and shut the door behind herself and her sons. And as she poured, they brought the vessels to her. And when the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, that is, there is not another. And the oil stopped flowing. She came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil, pay your debts, and you and your sons can live on the rest. Now I want you to understand, let's go back and look at this real quickly. This woman was in debt, and because of her debt that her husband left her because he just died, she was a widow, uh, that in that day, whenever you had a debt you couldn't pay, they'd come get your sons and force them to work in slavery until you paid off your debt. And so her sons were going to be forced into slavery as they worked to pay off the debt of their creditors. And I would think that this woman, when she came to Elijah, was not looking for anything other than money. Right? If I'm in debt, I don't need comfort. I don't need a pat on the back. I'm not saying that's not a good thing. What I really need is what? Money. Right? Because I'm not getting out of debt with what well, my friend said, uh, I'm going to get through this. I can go to the creditors and present that to them, and they're going to say, well, that ain't going to help you. So I know I need money. When this woman came to Elisha, I'm pretty sure she's saying, Elisha, you need to help me here, and I need money. I could probably venture a guess that what Elisha gave her was far from what she had in mind. But what he gave her was more valuable than money. Let me tell you why. Elisha gave her a word. And in this word is contained what? The power of God to bring itself to pass. But the word of God is not released unless it's mingled with faith. So he gave her the word. He told her what to do. The word spoken to her contained the power to change her world. However, what she needed to do was to put faith to that word. 
She needed to believe the word and begin to act on the word, and the oil didn't start flowing until she acted. A lot of times we say, okay, we'll let the oil flow, and then I'll go borrow the vessels. No, she had to borrow the vessels, close the door, and start pouring, and the oil didn't flow until she poured. Am I making sense to you? You see, we want it the other way around. Well, if I see it, then I'll believe it. And God says, if you believe it, then you'll see it. So she had to, to, to come into agreement with the word. She had to, and as she did so, the power of that word was released. And I want you to know it's a supernatural power because I've gone home and I've taken that last bit of oil and I've used it. And I want you to know that I just had a little bit of oil and I didn't have anything more unless I went to Kroger's and bought another bottle. And it's not because I don't have faith, it's because I don't have a word from God that says this is going to happen. When you have a word from God, within the word is the power to bring itself to pass. He said, go pour the oil, and as you do, begin to pour and keep on pouring. So it wasn't the oil that was supernaturally charged, it wasn't the vessels that were supernaturally charged, it was the word of God, and it was her faith that released the word to flow into her life. It's not faith to just hear the word. It's not faith to just hear the word and even agree with the word. It's not faith to just hear the word, agree the word, and memorize the word. It's not faith to hear, agree, memorize, and even speak the word. It's faith when we hear, agree, memorize, speak, believe, and ultimately act on the word. I'll give you an example. It's, it's a kind of a funny example, but it's, it illustrates exactly what we're talking about. There's a, a, a place where there was a famine, I mean, a, a drought going on. Drought been going on for a while. Finally, the pastor calls together and says, we need to pray. If we don't believe God for rain, we're not going to have any rain and the crops are going to die. We need to pray and have a prayer meeting and believe God for rain. And so everybody came together, uh, you know, like they did. They called everybody to come. And when everybody came, a woman came in wearing a raincoat and she had a, 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 an umbrella and the rest of the church was just laughing at her. Why you got that umbrella? Why you got that raincoat? It had rain in a long time we're here to pray for rain why would you bring that he said well I thought we were praying for rain if we're gonna pray for rain I believe God's gonna answer and so I'm ready for the answer sometimes people of faith look foolish in the eyes of the world sometimes people of faith look foolish in the eyes of a church that's not walking in faith right but I'm telling you this woman had faith right if we were to go and talk about finance, I was talking about this with Bobby the other day. It's amazing how many people, I uh, actually was talking with Rudy about this the other day, people struggle with their finances, and you tell them this is what the Word of God says, and they said, I don't even have enough money to pay my bills. How in the world am I going to start tithing? How in the world am I going to start giving? And they say to themselves, I can't afford to tithe, but the Word of God teaches us that we can't afford not to tithe. You see, it's not a natural thing. It doesn't work out by math. It works out by faith. This is what the Word of God says. God says, trust me in this. Bring the tithes into the storehouse and watch what I'm going to do. And so when you do that, when you are obedient, you say, well, this is what God's Word says. Doesn't make sense to my natural mind. Doesn't make sense to my situation that's going on. But God's Word says to do it. And so it's going to take faith. But listen, I'm in trouble. Uh, I'm in trouble a little bit or I'm in trouble a lot it don't matter I'm in trouble so I might as well I'll take a risk and I start believing God I start believing God and then I start giving and when I start giving it's not the uh, the principle it is the power that's in the word that begins to work within your life but I will say this you might give once you might give twice and you might say hey it didn't work God will prove himself but you've got to be consistent because you've got to change years and 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 decades of false, uh, uh, I mean, of, of, of sowing into something that's not going to work, and when you begin to sow into the kingdom of God, you might get a harvest today, but it might be a month, it might be two months down the road, but I'm telling you that God's word is true, and you might say to yourself, how do I know that? Because one, the word of God teaches that, but two, I'm a living example that if you give, God will give back to you. I've proved it out in my life. And then it's just up to us to say, okay, I'm going to believe God. But it's not believing God just saying, I heard a good teaching. It's not believing God just saying, I'm going to memorize the scripture. It's not believing God saying, okay, I'm going to memorize the scripture and declare the scripture. It's not just believing God and doing those things. Believing God is not actually done until you give. 
and not giving one dollar, not giving two dollars. If you're making fifty dollars, you give five. If you're making five hundred dollars, you give fifty. A tithe is ten percent. It's not faith until you do what God's word says to do. And you say, well, I can't understand it. I can't make it. I'm, I'm telling you, it's supernatural. It's not just natural power. It is supernatural power that's released into your life when you believe what God's Word said because the Word of God has the power within it. We just have to believe it. Amen? James 2, 17 through 18. So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you by faith by my works, by what I do. Matthew 9, 27 through 31, we're almost done. And as Jesus passed from there, two blind men followed him, crying aloud, saying, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to him, Do you believe that I'm able to do this? Now I want you to understand the context here. On the road somewhere, we don't know how far away. Let's just use an example here. It could have been at, at uh, cause back then they didn't have cars. They didn't have carts, they walked. Maybe, maybe he met him out here in Luby's. And Jesus was walking to the church, let's just say here from Luby's, and the blind men are calling out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus, son of David, have mercy. Jesus, keep on walking. How long did he keep on walking until he got to the house? Well, if the house is over here on Flag Lake Drive, they had to, these are blind men, they can't see. Where'd he go? I can hear. You, you, talk, you think that was easy? Why were they following him? Because they believed that something could happen if they could just get a hold of him. That's faith. That's believing God, right? They'd heard the reports, and they said, he's done it for others, he's going to do it for me. So when he entered the house, he turned around, and guess who's there? The blind men come to him. And Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I'm able to do this? And they said, Yes, Lord. He touched their eyes and he said, Let it be done according to your faith. And their eyes were open, and Jesus sternly warned them, See that no one knows about this. But they went away and spread his fame throughout all the district. Finally, Mark 11, 22 through 24, last scripture, Jesus said to them, Have faith in God. Another way of translating that, have God-like faith. What does God like faith said? Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, what is a mountain? A mountain is a problem. A mountain is an impediment. It can be a sickness. It can be an illness. It can be a, 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 a mountain of debt. It can be all sorts of things. It can be a wayward child. It can be a vice that you can't seem to shake. That's a mountain. And I want you to see what Jesus said. Jesus said, this is what God like faith does. I say to you, whoever says to this mountain. So a lot of Christians try to live in denial. I don't have a problem. No, you got to face your problem. You can't be saying to yourself, I don't have a problem, and convince yourself you don't have a problem. If you got a problem, it's not faith to say you don't have a problem. It's also not faith to deny the problem. No, there's no such thing as a problem. That's not, there's no, and just kind of, and some, some people just want to live their life with blinders on. You know, they got issues going on at home, they got issues going on in their life, and, and they just want to lick these little blinders and convince themselves that everything is okay. As long as I don't see it, it doesn't exist. Wrong. That's not true. That's not faith anyway. What does God-like faith look like? God-like faith is you look at the mountain and you begin to speak to the mountain. And you might say to yourself, how is speaking to the mountain going to change everything? Because Jesus said it would. What do you speak to the mountain? You don't say, oh, you lovely mountain. Oh, you pretty little mountain. You don't say that. Or you also don't say, hey, Mr. Mountain, can you do me a favor? No, that's not what you say. What you start speaking to the mountain is you start speaking with authority the word of God. Mountain in the name of Jesus. The Bible says uh, that, uh, you know, I, I, whatever I loose in heaven, will, it's loosed in heaven. If I speak forth, it will be loose. Whatever is bound in heaven, if I speak it forth, it will be bound. The Bible says he's given me authority over serpents and scorpions, over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by an enemy harm us. And so I begin to speak the word of God. I can do this better with my own personal journey, walking out with, with my, my, my injury that I suffered many, many years ago, and I struggle with with my back. I don't say that I own it. I struggle with it. I'm fighting against it, and how do I fight? Every morning, I get up, I take communion, and in taking communion, I begin to quote the Word of God, and the Bible says, you forgive all my iniquities, you heal all my diseases, not some of them, not most of them, but all of them. The Bible says, you carried my sicknesses, and you bore my pains, and by your stripes I am healed. The Word of God, and I'm not just speaking to myself, I'm speaking to the mountain, I'm speaking to the problem. 
The Bible says that the one who fears my name, the son of righteousness, will arise with healing in his wings, and I will go forth like a calf, leaping from its stalls. And then I take communion, and I say, God, this is uh, my prophetic uh, 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 act. This is my uh, uh, public declaration. This is my point of contact with your word. And so by faith, just like Abram changed his name to Abraham, I am saying I am healed and I am whole, not because I'm experiencing it, because, but what your word says, but because your word says that it is mine. And so I'm walking this out, I'm believing it. And then I say to my body, I started doing this. I start speaking to my body. I said, I speak to my body. I speak to my spine. I speak to my L5, S1 vertebrae. I speak to the nerves, the muscles, the joints. I speak to the tendons. I, I rebuke pain. I rebuke stenosis. I rebuke arthritis. And in Jesus' name, I release healing and peace into you. And in Jesus' name, I said, you are whole. I will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Are you seeing what I'm saying? So I speak to that mountain in Jesus' name. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And that's what we have to do. And to and, and so be taken up, uh, truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says, and the Greek says what he says, and continues to say. So in other words, sometimes you've got to speak to that mountain more than once. If you believe that it will come to pass, and here's the key, you don't do it, it says it will be done for him. If you'll stand with God and raise the staff, it's not the staff that moves the sea, it's God that moves the sea. The staff is just following the word of God to Moses and it is his sign of faith, believing God. But God is the one that moves the sea. Am I saying, am I understanding? It wasn't Moses' faith, it was Moses' trust and Moses' obedience that released the power of God's word into the situation and that whole sea was moved. So, then we get to the conclusion here, and it's basically this. Whatever you're going through in life, God has an answer to it. And the answer is found in his word, right? You've got to start by coming and believing this is God's word. This is truth. This is scripture. And, and it is uh, God is faithful. His word is, is sound. His word is true. And I need to put my faith in this word. So you've got to believe that the word of God is true. Second thing is, uh, believing that God's word is true, you have to understand that, what is the second point that I have there? You want to come up real fast? The second point that I have is God's word is powerful. But in order for that power to be released, I've got to put my faith in God's word. And I didn't bring it out today. You've got to persevere. You've got to stand on it. You've got to walk it out. You've got to believe God until it manifests. Abraham believed God for uh, 25 years, but 25 years later, the promise of God came to fruition in his life. Some of you have been believing God for a long time, continue to believe God. Some of you just began to believe God. Believe God. Stand. He is faithful. Trust in him. He will prove himself true. You will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Believe God. Trust him. Obey his commandments and watch what God does in your life. I want to encourage you. Bottom line is, and I, and I had you at the very beginning, you could have left. You must believe to 